One of the simplest ways that I've ever come up with in order to, to show someone the effect of um, tracking and training, I usually have a round dowel available with me and just a pad of paper. If I put the dowel down and I put the product on top of it and I push in the center, it goes straight, right? If I put the paper down and just slightly move this off of dead center by angling it, I'm turning the bicycle and look what happens to my paper. It starts moving to the right. When you talk to your customer about tracking and training, that's one of the easiest ways to show them what happens. The point in which it comes in contact with the conveyor belt that you're using, the point that comes in contact first is the direction that that belt is going to track. Everybody understand that? You can try it on your own right in front of you. You've got these pads. You can place it on there and, and see by pushing in the center of your paper, you can cause that belt to either track to the right or the left, or if it's perpendicular, it will be square, and it will track square. Okay, now, one of the things that was mentioned earlier was the fact that we have tech notes, and you are all encouraged to use your NIBA resource by going online and you can pull up there are 27 different tech notes of topics that we've talked about today that you can download and print into this fashion and that's for your purposes only though don't be handing them out to customers it kind of gives you that caveat on I think every last page of, of that but for an educational purposes you have a wealth of information from belt camber, belt storage, conveyor belt tracking. That's what this tech no note is all about, tech note three. And it goes all the way through 27 different tech notes that have been written that, were, that are helpful to you and you should carry with you as a reference. So if, if you do go online, www.niba.org you would be able to pull up all the different tech notes and then it'll print in a PDF fashion. I still burn paper, okay? Or you could save the tech notes to your laptop that you carry around. I do that first before I print them off so I've got a hand carry copy if I don't want to carry in a computer. But it's a good reference tool. And so tracking and training is one of those tech notes that, that you have the opportunity of of learning more about. This little conveyor, and I'm going to invite you all to come up and take a look at, this is not a head pulley, tail pulley, typical drive system. This is a center pulley drive. That's what it's identified as. It's a center pulley, drop center pulley drive. So your belt is coming around and going down around that drive pulley and, well, it's coming this way and going around in that direction. So as you look at this conveyor, where is the tight side? The tight side that has most of the tension on it. Down here, really. And it goes all the way. Here's your, your tail, your terminus, in, in a sense because of the way this is operating. Because the drive is coming this way, in a typical pulley system, there you go. You see it comes down and around and then back out to that. So we've adjusted the center drive pulley and that's where a tape measure comes in handy. We can check the center, if you will, on this side here to the center of the take up device and you can tell if you've got that square. The most important thing anytime a conveyor system is put together 
is always check that the system is square, that from head to tail, you've got the same distance, that it's also level. Because if a conveyor system is not level, you're going to have fits in training that belt. So it's center, center to center being square and level. So as we're doing this, what I went through yesterday was trying to get everything centered up as best possible. Now if you notice how this is running, it's running pretty straight. Not bad for an amateur. Okay. Now I want you to see what happens. How about you do this? Just turn that to the left. To the left. Keep going. Just hold it for there for a little bit. Now, one of the things you, when you track and train, you make your changes, but don't expect it to move right away it has to take at least three revolutions before and look what it's doing. It's walking, isn't it? Is it coming in contact with that pulley first on this side? It's like steering a bicycle. Now you've moved it over, right? All right, you can move it back. How are you going to move it back? Turn it the opposite direction did before. Just a little bit. Okay. Now it's starting to move, isn't it? It took a, at least two full revolutions before it even moved. And that's one of the things that people start cranking on a system and they make ma major changes before the belt has a chance to move. Now we've got it running. You can move it a little more yet. I don't remember how many times you turned it before. Yeah, so, I, I <laughs> but how are we going to measure it if, to, to determine if we squared this back up? Right here, right? We can take a measurement here. We got about an inch of that particular. We still need to come out about an eighth of an inch on this side. Very, very close now. Probably tracking better than it was just when, I, when we started. Roy, you're calling this track and train? Yeah. Wait, what's the training? Well, it's training the belt to stay in a, you know, the tracking and training is one and the same thing. You're, but, but you're wanting to track the belt so it is trained to operate. Now you've, you've tracked it without a load on it. If I start putting a load on it, it may change. And I've actually done that. What if you do like this? Your side loading caused it to move over, didn't it? If you put weight on it, it's going to cause it to, to move in a direction. If you've got it trained and tracked properly, it's going to stay relatively centered. If you didn't, if I would have put the pressure on that side when it was tracking over here, I'd have driven it off the, the head pulley or this, or this pulley here, the discharge pulley, and it would have torn up the belt. Or I imagined it on a a longer, wider belt. Now we're running this very slow just so we can demonstrate this very easily. Now in this kind of a situation we can also make the changes down this end. You want to write this, run the smart screw? This one here has all these adjustments so we can we can just change it there too. This time keep count. Too full. Is that enough? Yeah. You're driving it the other direction. You see that? 
because that side is coming in contact with the pulley first. Right. Okay. Boy, on initial startup, before you get it to where you can somewhat right. track and train it, would you X across? That is one way to do it. If it's, if it's that long a conveyor, a lot of times, or that, that length of conveyor that you can do an X dimension from one corner, making sure you're keeping it the center of the shaft to the opposite center. You can do an X. That's one way of doing it. But get, check your system to see if it's square first and level. Sometimes you'll have conveyors that have a dog leg in them. You know, good luck on trying to train it. Okay? Huh? Then they'll trash the belt every month. It'll tra yeah, absolutely. And they'll blame the belt's no good. You didn't do a good job of lacing it, right? So it's important, it's important that you know how to troubleshoot a system and go out and, and, and inspect it and ask them, have you shot a, if it's a long conveyor, have you shot a laser along, along that edge? Black & Decker sells an a, a inexpensive laser, laser that people use in their homes to um, uh, ha hang pictures. You could use the same thing to shoot that laser shot down a conveyor to see if it's straight. Take a level with you to make sure it's, it's level. You can use a square. Yeah, see what you did over there? Why don't you move it back? Now you're going to take it two tr full turns back, right? Mm -hmm. I'd encourage any of you who want to try this so you, so you get a feel for what this is like. But it's not going to move right away. What makes you decide which end you're going to start well, it, up or loosening? Or? Because this has a center drive, it's, it's different. You should always work toward the tail pulley first, okay, on a flat conveyor. On a trough conveyor, you want to be on the, the bottom side and track toward the tail as well. On the, what they call the T2 or slack side of the conveyor system. Moving in on a trough conveyor system on the top side is very difficult because it's higher tension. So you'd always want to be tracking you want to make sure that your, your belt is coming into the tail pulley square. If the system is square and it's coming in square, you don't normally cock the pulleys like this, okay? You adjust it with your, your idlers that it's coming in contact with. Again, it's steering that bicycle. Just always think of that or think of that taking a dowel and, and understanding how you're moving a belt. Anybody else want to try this? Did it work? You got it moving back, huh? So if you... Putting pressure on that load. It wanted to jump right back, didn't it? Once I, once I took the load off. Anybody else want to play with it to see what they can do? We can make it move the other direction too. He did it on this end. Otherwise, that, that's what tracking and training is all about. It's, it's a simple concept if you think of level, the squareness, and you could, you could take a, uh, a T-square if your system is square, starting with that, you could take a T-square and make sure your tail pulley and head pulley are square with the system. That's one way to do it to start with. But never allow a new belt to be put onto a conveyor system without them checking the squareness. I'm a believer in only having a flat pulley on a drive pulley, number one, because that is the tight side is coming into that drive pulley and you're keeping the most contact. You move a belt on the, the slack side, which the tail pulley is, is located on. But you're moving the belt by using tracking mechanisms going toward that tail pulley. You're still just taking it up. That assist of that pulley 
is going to be a occurring because you've made the adjustments going into that pulley. But some people want to crown the head pulley, and I, I just, you know, I, I've never seen where it's benefited you that much. But that's the only pulleys that can be crowned, the head and the tail, the drive pulley. This pulley here is, I'm, I'm betting anything, it's flat because of the way, it, and, and the way in which it handled itself when I was adjusting it. I just had to adjust this square, square to start with. I started there yesterday, making sure that this was even. And then I had to move to each end because all of this was loose. So we'd have been here longer than we want to be doing this kind of playing around if we'd have started with it totally loose. But the key point, as I'll restate it again, think of tracking and training as riding a bicycle. You're going to cause that belt to move in the direction you're steering. And you steer it by what is coming in contact with the pulley first. The edge, it's going to move in that direction. Uh, that, that Roy mentioned this, it can take a long time and many revolutions on a slow conveyor for those warp cords in that belt to find where they want to run, where they want to share that load equally. You influence it, it catches up with itself over time. That's why the old belt ran fine and the new one doesn't. It's got to have time to find that spot where it wants to run, particularly in old equipment. It's been run into by a fork truck or who knows what. It might be a little crooked. That's why those adjustments are on there, is to get those warp cords to share the load. Um, old belts have found that sweet spot. New ones are still trying to find it. Probably a little tougher with things like monofilaments and stuff because they're more rigid and take more time to find that sweet spot than maybe spun fabrics would that are a little more forgiving. So it, it, it key point takes a long time, many revolutions, very small adjustments. I know Royce probably said that, but yeah. you can be fighting that against the you know right against those rollers. Yeah, just yeah. just put a steel red uh, steel rule edge. Straight right, edge. right over the top of it. And if it goes like this, you know you've got a crown. Okay. Because if it's lagged, you might be more difficult to see. And that's a, that's a good opportunity to, once the belt is off, check the lagging that they have on that pulley, the head pulley, the drive pulley. That's a good time to check that. And you may find another job because it may need re-lagging. Because if a, if a lagging is glazed, and you don't understand what I mean by glazed? Okay. It's a good opportunity to say, hey, you know, you're not gonna get the life out of this belt if we don't take this head pulley out and re-lag it for you. Yeah, cargator belts, we, we never did a cargator belt unless we re-lagged. I mean, we would not do it. And, and why is that? Well, Tom? I mean, the belt's on there for six years. It's running uh, anywhere from almost nothing to uh, six or eight hundred feet a minute. You get a lot of cornstarch, which is, uh, you know, Budweiser reject material that uh, is glue for the corrugated material, yeah. and it builds up and it gets slick, and, and, and it just won't run. And and also, paper dust is very abrasive. Yeah. Very abrasive. So it's going to wear away that, that uh, lagging material. A lot of times when you're making a, a visit on a, on a plant and you're getting ready to supply the belt, maybe get a chance to look at the system before you do that. It's best. And you might be able to get that pulley pulled out in advance. They've got to take the time to repair something that's needed. Another, tracking problems can be a key indicator of a, a, a problem with the equipment. Right. Either maintenance-wise, uh, bearings that are hung up, things that aren't square or level. Uh, uh, belt problems are key indicators. If there's something wrong with that system, it will show up in that belt first. 
you won't know that that bearing might be hung up on one side and not the other or whatever's going on. So it's always good to remind these folks that when you put a new belt on to get everything square level and plumb, plumb check it out. If something's not working exactly right, there's probably something wrong in the system. Conveyor belts don't run themselves, they are run by something. And those forces will uh, show up in the belt either running true or not running true or not doing what it's supposed to. It doesn't do you any good to sell somebody a belt that doesn't work or that they don't like. Sometimes you're doing them a bigger favor to troubleshoot that system than you are by throwing another style of belt at the problem. Rarely do you fix it with another style of belt. More often than not, you'll fix it by having them think about their system and uh, problems that might be in that system making that belt do something. Today, there are fewer and fewer maintenance people in plants. You are performing the maintenance duties that many times would be done by the, their people. So they're looking to, to the, their vendors to make sure that they get their value out of their product they're buying. And you can value add by selling additional services. That's key to all your management's wishes, is make your time at that location valuable. If you're done working on a system and waiting for a cooker to be done, it's a good time to ask, are there any other conveyors? that I could look at to see how they're performing. It's a way to value add. You're their maintenance department. They're, Think of it that way. Yeah, there are business models out there working today where companies take complete ownership of the conveyor from start to finish. And they charge so much an hour for the operation of the conveyor, so much for how much material flows over the conveyor but they take total responsibility from the drive components, all the idlers, the belt, the install, the maintenance, the cleaners, everything. And that's the way they, that's the way they run their business. And so it's a real marriage contract between the supplier, you, the supplier, and the customer. And the, the companies uh, like to relieve themselves of that uh, requirement that they have to have the trained people and the expertise to do that. Right. So more and more you're going to see this. You're, it's not just a, a tier one type of a supplier situation. It's where you are the total supplier, contractor, uh, maintenance uh, function 100% for that particular system. Sell the services and charge for it. Don't be afraid to charge for it.